And did everyone get the notes? I sent three documents. Uh, we're going to pick up from Adam last time, and we might move into Noah Abraham. Uh, so if you're wondering why there's such a multitude of documents, that's why. But if you could open us up in prayer, Cliff, that'd be awesome. Lord God, thank you for your great wisdom. Amen. Well, you can turn in your Bibles to Mark 10. We started Mark 8, Mark 9, and I'm going to read a section from Mark 10. And while you're turning there, I'm going to give you a quick conclusion from our first study of, of why we're doing this. So as you turn in Mark 10, hopefully you can multitask. Uh, firstly, God has purposed in his will that... He carry out his purposes in the world through his servants. So if we want to be used by God, we must be more servant-minded. Second, we said that to belong to the Lord is to be a servant. There's no option. To be a follower of Christ is to be a servant of the Lord. Third, we saw that to be a servant of the Lord is the greatest honor and privilege in the world. And then lastly, holiness is servanthood if you want to grow in your sanctification that is to grow in your servanthood and hopefully we will be able to not only see it in scripture but apply it to our lives so in mark chapter 10 and jesus is foretelling his death a third time in verse 32 and that follows right off the heels of the account of the rich young man or the rich young ruler and he had everything but he did not want to give it up to follow Jesus. And right after that, in verse 32, Mark writes, And they were on the road, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink or to be baptized with the baptism which I am to be baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. And is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then it's followed by the account of the healing of Bartimaeus, which Mark places intentionally, because before Mark 8, there's a half healing. And as it were, the man whom Jesus half heals initially sees only half of Jesus. And then Jesus fully heals him. It's not because Jesus is unable to fully heal or, or you know, his battery was half charged, so he had to do it in two installments. Mark is trying to teach us something, that before these three exhibitions of Jesus as servant, And the disciples not getting it, they're like that blind man. They see Jesus as king, but they don't see him as servant king. They see a half Jesus. And it's right after Jesus gives this sort of climactic explanation of who he has come to be, a servant. Then there's the full healing, and Barnabas follows him. And so I think what Mark is teaching us here is that 
as we follow Jesus rightly, we must see him rightly. Yes, he is the king of kings, but he is also the servant of the Lord. And this is the truest expression of his humanity and his mission. So, all that being said, we can turn back to Genesis chapter 1, all the way back, the first couple pages of your Bible. We're looking at the first servant of the Lord. Jesus is the servant of the Lord. He is the true servant. He is the essence of what it means to be God's servant. And we saw last week from, from Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 that one of Jesus' titles is he's the second Adam. So we shouldn't be surprised that if Jesus is the servant and he is the Adam, then all of his types and shadows in the Old Testament, all those that pointed forward to him, would also be servants. And the reason we're doing this is I want to show you that this is such a pervasive theme. That's not just in Mark 8 or Mark 9 or Mark 10, but this is actually one of the major themes of what it means to be a follower of Christ. What it means to be a believer in the true and the living God is to be his servant, that he actually created Adam in the garden to be his servant. And we're seeing that this word for servant is not an undignified term, okay? To the degree of who the master is, is the, to the degree of the honor of the servant. And so, uh, as we've seen, it is better to be a servant of the Lord and be free in him than to, as it were, be free and a servant of sin and of the world. Okay, so please, whenever you hear this word servant or slave or bond servant, right away we get all up in arms and we think it's some kind of, of insulting term or you're lesser than. Well, Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, he was a servant. And he came into the world not to be served, but to serve and to give up his life as a ransom for his many. So, we saw in the book of Genesis that God created Adam and he put him in the garden to work it, to serve it. It's the same Hebrew word. And to keep it or to guard it. And so already we're seeing pictures of Adam uh, as this royal priest who serves on behalf of God for God. Okay, it just helps you to see that this is the first Adam, that he's, he has royal connotations. So to be a servant doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's not royal. Actually, true royalty in the Bible is servanthood. It's so different than the world. Remember what Jesus said. The kings of this earth, they lorded over others. They got slaves, right? They, they, they whistle and people jump at them. And they want this and people do this. And they lord it over them. And they're harsh taskmasters. That's how the world is. That's how CEOs of the world lead. That's how governments lead. They're tyrannical. What is true leadership? It's servant leadership. Right? Jesus is saying, you're getting your cues of what it means to lead from the world. You need to get your cue of what it means to lead from me and my example. And that's what Paul teaches. We've seen it in Philippians 2. Have the mind of Christ. When there's a church that's biting and devouring each other, or if there's strife within the family, if there's strife within relationships, it'll basically come down to this. You have two people who are vying unbiblically for kingship. Could you imagine if there were two people who were vying to, to outserve one another? That'd be wonderful to see. I'll outserve him. I'll outserve him. That, it actually says that in Romans 12. It's the first thing where it says uh, that you're to, to be renewed by the, by the transformation of your mind or transformed by the renewal of your mind. He says, do not think more highly of yourselves, but think with sober judgment. Outdo one another in showing honor. Outserve each other. That's what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. And this is what God had planned for the first Adam, as it were. He failed, and then we're going to see that all of those who follow him fail in their servanthood mandate. And so we're waiting for Jesus, the true servant. However... As we're seeing in our study, that God doesn't just bring a servant into the world. He brings a servant into the world who will create a servant people. Okay, and that's very, 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 very important for us. Okay, if we want to follow the servant, we follow him as servants. And it's really unfortunate that in, in sort of North American evangelicalism, we like Jesus being our servant. We want him to make us rich and happy and healthy, and we want him to make everything good in our life. We're happy when he's washing our feet, as it were, but we don't want to follow him. And when I say that our sanctification is our servanthood, I mean it, because sanctification is really to be made into the image of Christ. 
God predestined us in Romans 8 to be conformed into the image of his son. And his son came not to be served, but to serve. So to be made into the image of Christ is to be made into a servant. To have the mind of Christ in Philippians 2 is to have the mind of a servant. So in Genesis 2, 5, we read, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, there was no man to work the ground. So this is what you'd call part of the creation mandate, that God creates Adam and Eve, and he stewards them to take care of his creation. But that's in the context of us serving God. He gives them everything as stewards, and they're to care for his creation as his servants. And what a wonderful privilege that is without sin. Genesis 2.15 says this, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Or I might translate it to guard it. Okay? And so, if you're following in the notes, I'm on page 2. Um, I have two bullet points. First, Moses is showing us that humanity's work in the garden is framed in the form of service. Adam is a servant. Okay, and he's created in the image of God, interestingly enough. Second, Adam's commission to keep the garden carries with it notions of provision and protection. So even men, part of your service of your wife and kids is to protect them. Something that's actually really being eroded in our day and age. Right? So Adam is to protect Eve. And what happens in the very next chapter? He's to serve God by caring for creation, by protecting those entrusted to him. And then the slithery serpent sneaks into the garden and he begins to beguile Eve. And the Hebrew I would take is that Adam is there the whole time. So Adam's not serving God at that moment. He's serving himself. And before sin is as it were manifested in the denial of God, it's already springing up within his heart. So I just want to encourage us as men, serve the Lord and serve your wife, serve your kids, protect them, guard them. And that's more than just like protecting them from like guys wielding knives and stuff. Protect what they're watching. Protect what they're, what, what's influencing them. Protect them. That's not in the notes, but I, I think it's an apt application. So right onto those bullet points, there's the three R's. I wish... Dave Weens is here. He's all about the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Well, these are the three R's of being made into God's image. Reflecting, representing, and ruling. Okay, so I've underlined it and bolded them. And this is what it means to be a servant. We want to reflect God as his image bearers as we serve others. We want to represent his purposes. So we serve God in taking his rule and his reign and spreading his kingdom. And, and for us in the New Covenant, that means seeing the church flourish. And I'm not talking about bigger buildings, but evangelizing, discipling, going out and making disciples of the nations, right? This is what it means to re represent his purposes and then to rule over. And again, we think, oh, to rule over. This, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna go and abuse people and we're going to d destroy the earth. No, how did Jesus rule over? It's a servant leadership, right? Husbands, you are to lead your families. How? By loving your wives and giving yourselves up for them. Okay? So, we're, we're, we're taking the words that have been hijacked by society and we're putting the, the biblical meaning back into them. Because when people hear, oh, the husband's supposed to rule his wife, right away they get all up in arms. But they're to rule the way Jesus rules, with a servant leadership. Loving his bride so much that he would give his life up for her. Okay. So we have here that Adam is a kingly servant and a priestly servant. Okay. And to be made into his image, men and women, boys and girls, is to reflect those, those notions of being a, a king and a priest and a servant. And they're all overlapping and they all bleed into one another. If you're on the notes, tragically, what happens in chapter 3? God's servant, God's image bearer, he fails. 
Okay, so the idyllic, Edenic picture of Genesis 1 and 2 doesn't last long. Already Adam's giving in to the lie. Rather than serving God and finding freedom, he wants to become like God. And this is the great lie in universities and in culture and of the world. That if you somehow unhitch yourself from servanthood to God, you will be truly free. And nothing could be further from the truth. Right? And we saw that in 1 Corinthians 7. That, or in Galatians 5, or Galatians 5.13. Right? For, for freedom, Christ has set you free. But don't use your freedom for selfish purposes. Use your freedom to serve others in love. Right? This, is, this is what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5. And so Adam believes a lie, and we've been believing the lie ever since, that if somehow we can get rid of God, then we'll be free and we can live as we ought. How were things after? Already we have the first argument, right after sin, right? They cast off the restraints, sort of like a Psalm 2. The nations, they are, they are railing against God and the Messiah. Let us cast off his cords. Let us put away his fetters. How has that been going? It's not been going well, and if you were to... Watch my life, those moments where I'm not submitting to God as a servant. I'm the most miserable person to be around. And so they believe the lie. They think they can become like God. They think they can define and determine for themselves with their autonomous free will what is good and evil. And they find themselves enslaved to sin. They're fighting what happens with their children. While Cain kills Abel. And then is this... this this ruinous sort of genealogy of death, and schism, and strife. Because people don't want to serve God. And so I want us to present this to the world in such a way that, that to, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ is the most liberating thing in the world. It's because we're carrying out what we were created for. This is the way God has created us, and when we're living in conformity with his purposes, there's harmony. Yes, Nathan? There's a wonderful picture of, uh, uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, where uh, Paul addresses those who in that culture were slaves, mm -hmm. and he instructs them not to resist, not to change, but to turn service to their masters. Thank you for that in Ephesians 6. And that's following on the heels again of being filled with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 5. What it looks like, right, as we gather together, but also what it looks like in, in daily life, in family life, what it looks like. And that's part of, of a bond servant's expression of, of being filled with the Spirit is to do it joyfully as unto the Lord, right, unto Christ and not unto man. And, and it's wonderful. Colossians 3 says the same thing. Um, at the very end, it's like a new sentence says, you are serving the Lord Christ. And so I want to encourage us as we go about our duties, whether at work or at home or at school, to have this mindset that this is an expression by which I can serve the Lord. And it changes actually how you see going to work tomorrow. You can serve your boss. You can serve, and if you're a boss, you can, as it were, you're still their boss, but you can serve your employees. Because there's also stuff in, in, in Colossians and Ephesians about Christian masters. Yes, Nathan? Just a, it's interesting how, on one hand, uh, the scriptures you know, exhorts servants and slaves, um, and that really speaks to us as we work and we serve others as well. Mm -hmm. But how it talks about serving God as freedom. And this is the secret, is that serving the right master Amen. is actually freedom. 
that no one can, no one else can take it. Yes. You're truly free. Don't let anyone enslave you. Wonderful. Uh, I think everybody speaks, like in our culture, we talk a lot about, you know, uh, one of the toxic words is slavery, right? And it should have some aspect of very negative, like the child slavery that, uh, you know, will happen. But we have to understand and really see things from a biblical idea and not be, you know, just overwhelmed with all the rhetoric that comes from, you know, this professing themselves to be free that they didn't get this way. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you can even um, sort of see that in the book of Genesis where, where it's, it's sin that has come in and has destroyed this idea of leadership and servanthood, right? Because even Lamech, right, like already he's taking two wives and he's, he's sort of seen as a, as a cruel taskmaster, as a tyrant over them. And he's sort of like, you know, ordering his wives around and stuff like that. Well, that's sin, right? Um, and so if we're serving the right master... Uh, everything is transformed. Um, we used to watch uh, a series, it's a cartoon series with the kids um, from, from Voice of the Martyrs, and they, they sort of go through various figureheads of, of church history, and one of them was John Bunyan. He wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, and sort of chronicling his life, and uh, he, he was in prison for preaching the gospel. Right? He was the preacher in Bedford, and then all of a sudden the Catholic Church came in and said, uh, you cannot preach the gospel. And he kept preaching the gospel. He says, I must serve God rather than man. And so anyways, long story short is he's in prison and then there's this plague that breaks out. And so they let John out of prison. And they said, the reason we're letting you come out of prison because we know you will come back once the, the, the pandemic is lifted, as it were. And at the very end of the, of, of, of the little series, uh, one of Bunyan's fellow slaves said, there is the freest man I know but he's in prison, right? When you're reading the Pilgrim's Progress, do understand it was written not in an ivory tower. It wasn't written while he's on a Malibu beach. He wrote one of the greatest novels in all of history, the second best-selling book next to the Bible. He wrote that where? In prison as a free man. Okay, and so we just need to see things differently. So, so, so here he is in prison, and even his fellow prisoner says, there is the freest man I know. And... It's not like 21st century prisons, by the way, with all of, you know, the, the, the food and dietary restrictions and, you know, if you can, like, it wasn't like that. You often were sick and starving in prison. So, thank you for that, Nathan. Uh, it's just a great reminder that this theme is pervasive, you know, not only beginning in, in Scripture, but actually all the way through into the New Testament. And, and we find our great joy and purpose and meaning and satisfaction when we're becoming like Christ, who was a servant. Okay? Whether that's at work or in home or at school, to have this mind. Right? And think about what, what could that look like even when you gather at church? Like, okay, so we're probably going to extend the series a little longer. But, but as a pastor, sometimes people can get so stinky because they come to church and then they leave all sort of disgruntled because nobody was doing this for them or nobody was saying hi to them or no one was coddling them or no one was doing that well they've come to church with what kind of a mentality i've come to church to to be served and there's times for please don't hear me you know spanking but how different would it be if, if you said i'm going to come to church and i'm going to be on the lookout for people who are needy or someone who looks discouraged and there are plenty of discouraged people right we're humans we live in a fallen world but how different would it be if we came to church and like, I sure hope they say hi to me. I sure hope the pastor shakes my hand. Not like people care about that. But some people do get upset, right? If the pastor walks by them accidentally or something like that. But to have the mindset of Christ is, I can come here and how can I, how can I serve? Even when no one's watching. Well, that garbage is pretty full. I sure hope one of the deacons gets it. Oh, how, how can we help out? How can we set up the tables after? How can we watch over the kids? How can we serve others by spending time with them? It's just, just this pervasive mentality that I want us to get. Okay? So, Adam was a son of God. He was a servant of God. And so in the notes, I link the two. To be a son of God, small s, is to be a servant of God. To be in God's family as one of his children is to be in his family as a fellow servant. Okay? And so... As we've heard a thousand times, if you are a servant in Christ, become what you are. 
Right? That, that's one of the, the sort of common notes you'll hear in Paul's letters. He gives us just a ton of theology, like in Ephesians or Colossians or Romans. Here's who you are. Here's what Christ has done. Here's who you are by virtue of your union in him because you've trusted him. Here's who you are as a Christian. Now work it out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You are a servant. Now by the power of the Spirit and by the grace of God, work it out. Become increasingly a greater servant of others. Paul, we love... Right? He was like the apostle, but in, in the book of Romans, I hope I'm right here. Just give me a second now. I know it's in Titus because I preached in Titus. But in Rome, yes. So everyone loves Paul's letter to the Romans. It's his magnus opus. There's tons of theology. What's the first thing Paul says in the letter? Paul, a servant, bond servant, slave of Christ Jesus called to be an apostle. So even to read Paul's letter, which we love to the Romans, to read that theological masterpiece as sort of an ex exhibition of his servanthood. Paul's writing often from prison. And he doesn't have to, but as a servant of God, he wants to do this. And so he writes for us Romans as an expression of his servanthood. Okay, so before we move on uh, to, to Noah and Abraham, Thinking of Adam, right? Adam, please, please hear me. I do not believe in evolution, right? When I was a pagan and I learned it in, in university, when I did think critically, I believed all that rubbish. And this is why I would say a Christian can't because if, if Adam is created to be a servant and this is his essence, right? Uh, uh, the, the fancy word is his ontology, who he is, right? In his very core, he is a son and a servant. If we're now descendants of Adam, we can't escape being sons or servants. We can't escape it. Right? To be made in, in, in Adam's image or to be one of his seed or offspring is to be a son and a servant. And if you're a, a girl, please hear that in, in that idea of sonship. That means that you get all that the father gives. So it's not just a male thing. Right? You could say you're, you're a child then. Right, your son and your servant. However, we left off last week, you can be a son of God and a servant of Christ, or you can be a son of the devil and a servant of sin. N nobody in this world is not a servant. I know that's a double negative. Everybody serves someone. Everybody serves a master. And as, as Nathan was saying, it all depends, like, on who you serve. But you don't get a choice of who you will serve. I serve no one. I serve myself. You serve a tyrant. So I get that from John 8. Or even these religious Jews. They thought they were free. And they're like, well, Abraham's our father. And of course, Jesus says, if Abraham were your father, you would believe in me. And then they start attacking Jesus because the rumor was is that Jesus was born illegitimately. They didn't believe the Old Testament prophecies that the Messiah would come in to the world through the Virgin. And so they would say, we know who our father is. Meaning what? They're taking shots at Jesus, right? Did Mary commit adultery? Right? There's a backstory going on even in Jesus' upbringing. I'm sure he up teased and mocked quite a bit. But we know who our dad is. And then Jesus responds to them, well, your father is not Abraham. Because you reject me and because you are embroiled in sin, your father is who? It's pretty harsh. He says your father is the devil. Going all the way back to Genesis where there's two lines. There's the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And then they say, we're, we're free. We've never been enslaved to anyone. Meanwhile, they're enslaved to the Romans. And Jesus says, oh, no, you, you're enslaved to sin. Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. And so even these, right, you can't escape this by religion. The most religious people in the world are slaves to sin. And they are servants to sin. However... When you become a Christian, you become now a son of God and a servant of Christ. And that's just from Romans 6. We'll get there. But I just want you to see that in the notes. That you can either be a, a servant of sin or a servant of others. 
You can be a servant of self or a servant of righteousness. You can be a son of God or you can be a son of the devil. And it all, it all comes down to this. Have you come to Christ? Are you born again? Do you belong to him? Have you believed the gospel? And if you are a Christian, then remind yourself, I am a son and I am a servant. Holy Spirit, help me to live that out practically in my day-to-day -day life. Okay, so let's jump in. Nope, let's end here. It's 10.05. So I did send the notes out already. You can read them. Uh, we're going to look through the next servant, and his name is Noah. Uh, and then after that, we're going to look at Abraham. And then we're going to move into the book of Exodus and then see Moses. And then we're really going to speed it up, and then we're going to move to David and then to the Isianic servant, and then to Christ, and then to the apostles, and then to us. Okay, so that's sort of just sort of the GPS or the, you know, the Apple Maps or whatever it is. So next week, you can think about how is Noah a servant? How, how is he an Adam-like servant? And does he fail? And if he fails, why does he fail? And then what about Abraham? Is he an Adam-like servant? And does he fail, and how does he fail? So I, I want this to be practical. I hope you just see. I know this is tedious, but I have no problem because God inspired the authors of Scripture to give us this theme, starting from Adam to second Adam, extending to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. And that is just my prayer, Lord, for all of us, that you would give us more of the mind, more of the heart attitude of Christ that we would understand that to be filled with the Holy Spirit <coughs> is to not serve self, but to make ourselves servants of others. And Jesus did so gladly, not begrudgingly. And I ask that you would help us to serve others, whether a boss or family member or neighbors, even as Pastor Nathan mentioned, from the heart, not as men pleasers, as, as doing only service when others are watching, but doing it from the heart as to Jesus our Lord, knowing that you see Jesus and that you are pleased and honored and you honor those who honor you. And Father, I pray that increasingly, uh, Lord, we would uh, become known for that. And Lord, would you forgive us? I, I will confess first that this is a, a huge failure in my own life. But Lord, I ask that you would help us uh, to put off that old man uh, who's always seeking selfish ambitions and to put on the new man which is being created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and true holiness. Would you increasingly show us from your word what true righteousness and true holiness lives, looks like, what it looks like to live rightly and to be holy and set apart for you. Lord, just help us. And we ask that you would um, give us grace in this endeavor and that the world would notice and they would be drawn to Christ irresistibly. So we pray in his name. <laughs>